All right. Drew McManus from Satsong. Welcome to the Happy Hustle podcast, my brother. I am super stoked to connect. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. I'm stoked to talk to you. Yeah, man. Yeah, I mean, seriously, I gotta, I gotta be honest with you. You're one of my favorite artists. The song "I Am" is literally one of my favorite songs. Jam that on repeat. I mean, you are an amazing musician, but also <clears throat> you're just a spiritual seeker. You're, you're a martial artist. We have so much in common. I feel like you're also a, a Montana guy, which that's just what's up. But tell me something, Drew. What's something interesting about yourself that not too many people know? Um. It's funny because it's kind of an inside joke with my circle of friends. Uh, I'm a huge Dixie Chicks fan. Oh! <laughs> yeah, I love the Dixie Chicks. Um, Goodbye, Earl. Yeah, man, I love, that's a great, that whole record's great. Um, yeah. You know, another thing that's funny with me, I have, a, uh, I have like the weirdest attention span in the world. Like, I can't watch a movie all the way through, but I can watch like an eight-part Ken's Burns uh, historical series in one sitting it's the weird it's the weirdest thing man yeah that's like get me to watch a movie that's 90 minutes there's just this thing in my head that's like this isn't even real information we're just watching this for no reason but i can like like i said dude i, I watch i can watch the fucking ken burns civil war thing in like one sitting no problem it's so weird dude, that's hilarious i mean i feel like in this day and age everyone's struggling with some some add of i mean like the shiny object syndrome i know for the entrepreneurs out there and the happy hustlers we got to stay focused that's one of the biggest things to success is is focusing and you know it just i i totally hear you i right in front of me on my whiteboard it has it says the words focus <laughs> so yeah. i i hear you <laughs> it's an easy time to get distracted man for sure, man. Well, I want to talk to you first and foremost. I like to kick, kick things off with a bang. Talk to me a little bit about like your your methodology on creating, you know, epic music. Like, I, I mean, I, I want to hear some of that, like that process. What goes into putting putting out a song like I Am, and and you know, like the the behind the curtain, the behind the curtains, uh, Drew. You know. Yeah, you know, my creative process is weird because it just kind of happens, man. I don't, um, if, I, if I find myself struggling to find a line or something, I just put it down and walk away. Um, mm. Pretty much any song that we've ever released, you know, I always kind of joke that they they write themselves. Like they, I mean, they usually come out in, you know, two to five minutes. Mm. That's all it takes. Um, you know, I have like, like, like right now I'm sitting on a few um like chord progressions and riffs that i'm really in love with mm. and and when i'm not gonna sit there and fucking play the riff for an hour you know until yeah. something comes to me like I'll, it'll just come when it comes so i kind of look at my creativity i always joke that it's this like muse and i always refer to it as a female for some reason but i kind of <laughs> made this this deal with her that you know she's pulled me out of uh severe poverty and and allowed for me to provide for my family so whenever she calls I just pick up the phone and mm. um you know a huge part of that for me is I think you know I'm a really disciplined guy so you know uh exercise uh martial arts how I eat um mm. I think that whole thing plays a huge role in in the the channel staying open as it were you know is just yeah. trying to keep everything running at an optimum level and the rest will follow, you know? Yeah, for sure, man. I mean, I love that, how you put that, you know, like when she calls, you answer, <clears throat> <Yeah>. you know? <laughs> Have to. Yeah, I mean, the creative process, I think it, it is largely based on intuition, right? And what just feels right in your gut. And I think that's so cool that how you how you frame it and you you do, does she have a name your your muse or no uh, no i just yeah i always will just say oh shit here she comes and you know yeah. off i go yeah uh, i mean it, it it's awesome and, and i want to actually play a song in the podcast cool. if you're cool with it we're going to play a clip of i am so everyone can jam to it and hear sure. this and one of my favorite lines man and i just i mean I want to get into your backstory and I want to get into how you came to be and some of the adversity you overcome. But I love this line so much. I just wanted to start with it. Um, so it goes like this. Well, I'm perfectly imperfect and I'm only here to learn and all the evil on the path gets burned. I said, I'm perfectly imperfect and I'm only here to learn and all the evil on the path gets burned. I mean, 
I love that line. And I want to hear what you mean by that line and, and what that means to you when you, when you say something like that. You know, to me, it's this um, just kind of acknowledging, like, I think the minute that you think you've uh, figured it out or figured yourself out, you're fucked. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's kind of just this acknowledgement of like, even when I'm doing good, there's, there's still, I can do better. Mm. Um, and just that commitment to doing away with shit that doesn't serve me, you know, whether it's a bad habit or, you know, something I know that's just hindering growth or hindering, um, anything in my life you know anything that's slowing me down it's just this commitment to like anything in the way I have no problem getting rid of it you know whether it's a yeah a habit or a person or a relationship it's just like I, I have no problem pruning the tree um you know it's 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 yeah it's a big part of who I am you know yeah I, I love that I think that's such an important lesson you know as they say, you're the sum of your five closest relationships, right? You either round up or you round down. And, you know, all the happy hustlers out there know that it's extremely important who you surround yourself with. And, and I love that you say, you know, on the, all the evil on the path gets burned. Cause that, to me, that just sparks so much like, like inner thought of what can I get rid of? What's not serving me? Who are those energy vampires that are sucking my energy, you know? And, and then you say, I'm only here to learn. I mean, we're all basically just here to learn, to grow, That's to it. evolve. Right. I That's mean, it. ah, great line, man. Uh, I mean, seriously, I just had to start that. So, so talk to me, Drew, give us a little like backstory. I mean, talk to us about your, your childhood and kind of what, what that was like and, and then kind of how'd you get into music? Um, we, me and my brother, um, have, I have, I have a whole shitload of siblings, but I have one full <laughs> brother. Um, him and I have the same dad. My mom divorced our dad when I was two. You know, I don't ever remember him to be together. And she remarried real quick to a fella that that raised us. And we moved from uh, from Livingston, Montana, uh, to hmm. Des Moines when I was in like first or second grade. And um, you know, it was pretty pretty soon after getting to Des Moines. Um, our stepdad, who we called dad, because we were just you know we were with him eleven months of the year. Hmm. You know, he just started kicking the shit out of us all the time. It was a real wild way to grow up. Mm. Um, you know, a lot of violence in the house. He was an alcoholic. Um, and then same thing in our neighborhood. You know, it was um, it was a really interesting neighborhood because it was, um, you know, there was a higher black population than than most parts of the city. But then also because of the Kosovo situation, we had um, this big Section Eight project a couple blocks from our house that was all bosnian refugees oh wow. um yeah it was crazy and it, yeah it wasn't until i was way older that i <laughs> realized like because it was weird it was just like boom yeah all of a sudden we had all these bosnians in, in des moines um so it was it was rough man we got fucked with a lot you know and how my brother my big brother dealt with that is all right well i'm just going to be the baddest scariest dude that any of these motherfuckers have ever seen and then everyone will leave us alone. Hmm. So that's what he did, you know, and, and a huge part of me growing up was being identified as, as Aaron's little brother, you hmm. know? So my identity really is a, I didn't really start to form my own identity until, um, you know, until I left Des Moines, but um, I started playing music when I was in about sixth grade and by high school, I was, you know, pretty sure that was what I was going to do. Um, you know, I struggled a lot with, well, I wouldn't even say, I would say the last year was a struggle. The, the first part <laughs> was pretty, the first eight years or so was pretty fun. Yeah. Um, with drugs and alcohol, you know, I just, um, I always have loved the counterculture, you know? Mm. So I found skateboarding really early. Skateboarding was huge in Des Moines. Um, There's yep. a great fucking skate scene, great skate scene in Chicago. Yep. So I kind of was teeter tottering between being a skater, but then also going to like jam band shows and being in that subculture. Mm. And at the forefront of both of those cultures is drugs and alcohol. Yeah, you right. Um, so I learned how to sell drugs, you know, when I was about 15. In there. Um, <laughs> yeah, I had, I, I was, uh, you know, it's weird because you look back at it now and 
um, it, it seems weird, but I'm really grateful that, you know, I had no way to make money. I, I just couldn't have a real job, man. I don't, I don't know how to explain that to people. I just, <laughs> I'm not built for it, man. I just, there's, there's people that are built for it and there's people that aren't and I'm fucking not. So <laughs> you're preaching um, the choir on that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I just, I, you know, man, I had a, I, I, respect is a big thing for me. And when you work at a restaurant or, you know, a retail store, you know, being, especially in Des Moines, uh, because of who I was and who my brother was, I just, I really struggled with someone being able to tell me what to do. Mm. You know, if I just like my ego had a real hard time was like, motherfucker, yeah. motherfucker you go wash a table. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? Like, um, but uh, so I got put onto the game pretty young and, um, you know, that was my thing. And then once I moved to Chicago, um, I met Carl, who's, who's my bass player. And it's funny, man, we didn't really play any shows but he was the first person I met that really had a handle on recording music. Like that was where his interest was. He's a phenomenal songwriter and musician, but like mm. he was always, um, he was the first person I met that was recording himself. That was like adding MIDI drums and like playing all these instruments and like making MIDI string arrangements and shit. Like his shit sounded so good, you know? Mm. So we just, that's always been Carl and I's relationship was recording music. And, and we lived together for a while in Chicago. And then um, what's really funny, man, is when I left Chicago and got and, and moved to Montana and got sober music, it like turned off. Oh, really? Yeah, man. I didn't play huh. for, oh boy, probably six, seven, eight months. Wow. I just didn't pick up my guitar. I didn't know how sober you know? Huh. Huh. Um, so what do you think weird. that was? What do you think that block was? I, well, I think my consciousness had existed on a level where it was always altered. Oh. Um, so I think there was like a shock to the system where that like creative channel was like, whoa, hmm. there's nothing in here, you know, stoking yeah, yeah. our fire, you know? Um, yeah. But I, I, I took a, I took a, a trip to Nepal. Um, and when I, when I was over there, I was writing a lot. I had to carry everything on my back. So I didn't have a guitar, but mm. I was writing a lot. And, and there was this one kind of fateful day where I wrote thrill of it all at the top of, of Renjo pass, which is 20,000 mm. feet. Wow. And you're like looking at Mount Everest. I'll send you the picture of that. Day, yeah, but, dude. Um, it was on the walk down from that pass. It was the most pivotal moment of my life at the top of that pass that day. Wow. Um, but it was on the walk down where I was just like, all right, man, what am I going to do? Mm. You know, what's the fucking move here? Um, I had a really cush job in Red Lodge here. I worked at Sylvan Peak. Oh, store. I know the dice. I coach oh, the yeah, kids dude. in soccer. Oh, yeah. I coach the kids in soccer for a while, too. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's so funny. <laughs> but yeah, I worked at Sylvan Peak for like five years. So I had a really That's great so job. so funny. Um, and they would let me move in the winter. They'd let me move to part-time so I could work up on the ski hill and have a pass. So I had this perfect dirt bag life, you know, yeah. it was like in the summer, um, you know, I could call Marcy and be like, Hey, I heard that the fucking caddises are popping off on East Road. Can, <laughs> can I come in at 11 instead of nine? Yeah. No yeah. Problem. Go fly fishing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No problem. Or on a powder day, she would text me and just be like, you can come in at noon. Like, oh my gosh. you know what I mean? My whole yeah. life tailored to, to for being a dirtbag you know it was so badass um <laughs> but i was i just i knew that i had to do something mm. and it was it was in nepal where i was like all right man i don't know what the fuck i'm doing but when i get <laughs> back dude it's music like mm. that's it mm. um so i had this collections of songs it's funny because about half of the story of you was written there, but that wasn't the first album that I made. I actually made a, another album with a guy named David um, that was a mandolin player. And um, so him and I made these songs and I kind of left um, Thrill of It All, Story of You, I Am, all these songs kind of over here because I wasn't sure about them, particularly I Am. Oh, really? Yeah, it's funny, man. I, uh, I was very hesitant and trepidatious to release that song wow it felt like an overshare 
you know, yeah. I felt I was really like self-conscious about just like pouring that out. Did you write every word of it? Yeah. Wow. I mean, I, oh, every man. sat song song, I write all of our songs. Um, oh, wow. So, but it was weird, man, you know, and it was just this like simple repetitive chord progression and um yeah it's just weird that that song has has become what it's become because it's brought some really amazing people into my life and yeah um but well, yeah that's wild i mean well that song just for reference i mean that thing's blown up we're talking like over 10 million views on spotify right alone or like YouTube. yeah we had, i mean like last year across all streaming platforms it had like 17 million streams 17 i mean that's like that's it's fucking you think silly of, like you think about it though like and i just want to extract it because here you are you know kind of at a crossroads in your life right you know you're and then you commit to music and and I think a lot of happy hustlers out there can relate to this moment where it's like, man, I'm unsure. I'm trying to find my passion and my purpose and trying to figure it out. And then you just commit and you go all in and you're fearful and you have that compare and despair or the imposter syndrome, or that, like you said, that overshare. And you're like, ah, oh, should I, shouldn't I? And you went for it and it, and it changed your life pretty much. Right. Like, yeah, and it was song. a fucking, <laughs> yeah. And well, it was a grind, you know, it was like, yeah two years of just David and I, the mandolin player playing bars, you know, and doing like three hour bar gigs at like nine to 12 bullshit. <laughs> um, so it was a couple years of that. And then once David stepped away, I got a drummer and Carl moved out from Chicago to play bass. And then it was two years of touring and playing venues, but playing for fucking nobody, mm. like doing whole cross country tours you know, and we had like these little pockets where we'd get like 50 people. And that was a really good night. You know, 50 people Banger. Up, we were <laughs> yeah. through the roof. So yeah, it's wild. It, it, it always from the outside, but that's always how it looks, you know? Oh yeah. Um, Overnight from the success. outside, everyone's just like, oh yeah, this song popped and off he went. And, yeah. um, you know, it's funny, you know, on the hustler tip, it's, it's funny because the, the part, the part of my career that really shifted us was, we got asked, we had played this really cool venue. Have you ever been to Janice Live? In Tampa? Yep. Yeah. In St. Pete, that cool yeah, yeah, music Pete, venue. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we had played there with Nako uh, oh, he's a man in like too. 2017. And, um, or no, it would have been like 20, early 2016. Anyway, um, the promoter down there was having Franci play and they didn't have an opener. So mm. he hit us up and said, hey, I can give you 500 bucks would you guys want to open for Franti? And I was like, okay, well, I got to get fucking three guys from Montana to Florida. Like, is it worth it <laughs> yeah. to do this one show? And my manager at the time got in touch with his agent and he, we found out that we could get on two more shows. Mm. And um, the reason I said yes was the way Janice is set up is the, the green room or the backstage area is up on those balconies. Mm. So in my head, I was like, if we're playing, there's no way Franti's going to stay in his green room. He's going to come out and watch us. Yeah. So like, we'll go there. We'll fucking rage. Yeah. Franti will see how dope Michael Franti you're talking about, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So like, he'll watch us play and he'll be like, um, that's yeah, it. Come tour with me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to take you all over the world. Yeah. And, um, so what's funny is, is we get there, I see him and I've been a huge Franti fan forever because i always loved hip-hop always loved punk rock mm -hmm. always loved reggae and he was like the the like perfect culmination of all those things you know but so i see him and the fucking guy's like six foot six. Oh, really yeah he's, didn't know he's that big yeah man he played he played ball at uh ucsf and oh damn. um but uh so i see him and um we're getting ready to go on stage and he's just like are you ready and i was like <laughs> fuck yeah bro you know? <laughs> yeah. but so we go out we go out and play and i don't look up at the balcony the whole time and we get done and his monitor tech comes out and is tearing our shit down he's like bro michael was up there dancing the whole time and i was like okay step oh, one yeah step one and then uh i'm coming up the stairs he's coming down and i was like yo man uh can i get up and spit a verse with you he didn't say anything he just smiled at me and uh, he didn't let me up that night, but the next day at Soundcheck, 
his sound guy just comes up and hands me a wireless mic and Franti from stage goes, do a verse. So the whole band's playing. So I like spit a verse. But really years later, he long story short, he ended Damn. up hitting us up and going, hey man, we're doing four tours. Do you want to come on all of them? So he took Damn. us all over the country for all of 2017. That was what we did. We toured with Franti and Trevor. And um, Wow. Trevor but Hall, I asked right? him. Yep. Yeah. But I asked him, I said, you know, was it the show? He goes, no, nah, I mean, your band's great. Good songs. But what I used to do whenever we'd play a big show like that, I'd stand outside with CDs, you know, like I was selling dime bags. Oh, yeah. Slanging. And slanging. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, man, the, the, the band's great. But he was like, I made my decision when I walked across the catwalk and I looked out and I saw you in the middle of the street selling CDs. I said, all right, this kid wants it. He's hungry. He's hungry. So mm. I'll help him eat, mm. you know? Um, so that was it. It was really after those tours that we started selling our own tickets and, and everything kind of popped for us. Damn, dude, that's such an awesome story. And what, I mean, what I love about that is, you know, and people don't see like the 10 years leading up to the success, all the nights totally. playing, nobody shows, right? Like, you know, practicing in, in your room solo and, and practicing your, your voice. Yeah, and I mean, you got an amazing voice. Like, thank do, you, bro. What do you do to train? Do you have a voice coach or, you no, know? No, but I will say it's really funny. Me and Trevor are the only people I know that do vocal warm ups and cool downs. Oh, really? Nobody else does them. Um, huh. and, and maybe it's a subconscious thing, but I feel like going out on stage without doing a vocal warm up, I'm like, e yeah, you know, it doesn't feel good. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I take it real seriously, especially when we're on the road, I try not to talk very much during the day. Mm. Um, and I do a, a warm up and a cool down, but yeah, no vocal coach. Mm. Um, what about guitar? Like, I mean, I just got to say this. Really, dude? Yeah. I, I, my fiance, Steph, got me a, a acoustic guitar for Christmas. I have so much more respect for you and every other musician out there now than ever before. My freaking fingers. It's like I got, you know, like two left hands that are just both yeah, not Yeah, it takes working. a long time. Gosh. My mom got me a um, this Chet Atkins guitar book, and I didn't use it, but in the very back of the book was a chord chart. Mm. it had like every major and minor chord in, in the back of this book oh wow so i would just practice chords and, and figure out which ones sound together like oh going from g to c sounds good oh mm. if i go g d c that sounds good mm. um so just kind of figuring out what chords work together and then once i could fuck around then i start you know start being like okay well let's put on the dead and i'll see if i can figure out this song and Huh. You know, just self-taught. Kind of Damn, yeah. that's crazy. What well, what would you say, Drew, to to aspiring, you know, let's just say creatives out there who are in the thick of it, are still slanging their CDs, you know, what would you say to them out there? Uh patience and persistence, man. It's um I don't I'm not special, man. You know what I mean? And I have every marker in my story to not be successful. So the thing that's always separated me from work ethic was work ethic was that I just was like, you weren't, there's no fucking way I'm not going to make it. There's no way, dude, it's impossible. And, and I believe that. And I trusted that. And I did every single thing knowing that it was a phase. So when you're in that phase of playing for fucking nobody is you go, Oh yeah, I'm in that's, that's the phase of the journey that I'm in right now is the playing to empty venues. Um, because <clears throat> it's all a build first you got to get your body of music together then you got to go tour it um, and then you got to work hard enough that someone else notices your hard work and goes okay cool let's give them a shot um, so it's just a process and being self-aware is the biggest thing and being self-aware of where you're at in your process um, you know and I have I don't want to sound like a dick but I have a lot of musicians that just aren't very good that are really trying to force this thing. And I always am like, well, dude, maybe it's not music for you. Mm. You're so focused on music that what if it is fucking jujitsu or what if you're supposed to be a <laughs> carpenter? Or like, yeah, you know, I, I think you got to be really self-aware and realistic of like, mm. I've been blessed that we've always seen this very slow build. Even at the beginning, it was like, 
if there was 10 people at the show, all 10 of them were singing every word. So it was like, okay. Yeah. In theory, these people love this music enough that they're probably going to tell their friends, mm -hmm. you know? So it's like just being self-aware, man. Yeah. And, and, um, and, and persistent and, and you just got to be patient, man. Cause you never know what your thing's going to be. Yeah. You know, you never know when your Franti moment's going to come or as mm. if it's not going to be the show, it's going to be hustling CDs. So it's like, you just got to be doing all that shit. Mm, dude. So well said. I mean, patience and persistence. Those are like <clears throat> the two keys to success in any industry, in, in any thing you do, you have to have patience. You have to have persistence and you never know when your Franti moment's going to come. Like you yep. said, you never know when you'll get that that elevator pitch to the right executive for your startup. Like you'll not, you never know when you're, you'll get that, like that, that book deal for your, well, dude, your here's memoir. Here's a fucking crazy story. <laughs> okay. So I just watched this documentary about Oasis. Oh yeah. So a, a crazy thing about Oasis is from the time of their first show to, to them having a number one record was only 18 months. Oh, wow. <clears throat> so I what had know. happened was they drove overnight to play this show in Liverpool and there was an all female band that was supposed to play. And one of the girls in that band was previously dating this guy at a record label. He showed up to kind of be like, fuck you <laughs> almost just, you know, cause there's nobody at this show, but he showed up just to make her nervous. Right. Well, she sees that they're out there and goes to the Oasis guys. Why don't you play first? Like maybe he'll leave. <laughs> you know, oh. you, you guys play first, hopefully he leaves and then we'll go play halfway through that set. He had already made the phone call and said, Hey, I found this band in Liverpool. I'm fucking signing them. They're badass. Really? 18 months later, Oasis has two number one singles and a number one billboard record. Wow. So it's like, you just never know who the fuck is in the room. Yeah. You never know. You know, it could be one of those shows where there's nobody there, but one of the three people that's there that isn't on the staff. Yeah is the guy, you know, yep, it's like, you yep. just don't know, man. And like you're saying, it's like, dude, you get in a fucking elevator at the right time. You fucking yeah. go to a lunch and somebody's cousin yep. is there and happens to be like, Oh, I actually work for the home shopping network. That product sounds dope. Let's yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like, you just don't know. Yeah, man. It's so true. That's why you have to be prepared, you know? And I, I, I think that's a great lesson for all the happy hustlers out there. You have to be prepared to seize that moment when it does arise. Cause you never know when it's coming, but the preparation is essential to seize that moment. So I, I love that, you know, we got to that point because in, in this conversation, because I think that's such a, a valuable takeaway. Now, Drew, I want to ask you, I ask all my guests, and I think I know the answer because you mentioned it, but what was your first hustle? The first thing you did for money? Ooh, actually, man, even pre-selling drugs. Um, <laughs> I, uh, it's funny. No, I was I, wrong. <laughs> yeah. Um, that was my first legitimate one where I was like, damn, I'm paying my bills. I'm doing yeah, all right. Supply and um, demand. You learn. Yeah. So I had my, my boy Brock had a little 45 minute radio segment at the Des Moines area community college radio. And he was like, dude, we have this little four track board and I think we could record a demo. Like, I think I understand how to do it. Like we could set up one mic on your guitar, one mic here and let's record some songs. Now these things sounded like shit, no mix, <laughs> yeah. no master. Yeah. But um, because he worked there, they had stacks of thousands and thousands of blank CDs because a lot of times what people would do was they would have their radio show on a disc and then they just in between songs be like hey you're listening to DMAC public radio and then boom yeah. you know play the next song so we record this little four song demo and I, and I got like 20 CDs we just burned like 20 of them and I went to school at lunch and was just like yo man five bucks five bucks five bucks and I sold all of them. I was like, fuck, oh, man, I nice. just made $100. You know, yeah. like I made $100 at lunch. <laughs> and then, and then I, I went and bought an ounce of swag and chopped that bad boy up and flipped that. And off I, off I went. 200. <laughs> you know, yeah, now swag. it's 250. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but yeah, that's always been my thing, you know, and me from the beginning, man, with my business has always been self-investing. Mm. Um, you know, yeah, the double up and the triple up. It's yep. just like, okay, cool, man. I can sit on this. 2500 now yep 
or I can invest it in merchandise and double my profits in six months. Mm. Like, yeah, I'm throwing the 2,500. I'm on five grand in six months, not 25 now. Mm. So that's just always the been long my game. shit. Yeah, yeah. And I think, and I think a lot of that comes from, from selling drugs, man, is yeah. you go, okay, cool. Well, now I got this money. Fuck man. If I get a half pound, that's a better price. That's a better price point. That means I'm making 30 yep. and eighth. Okay, cool. Let's yep. run that. So it was just like, that's always been my shit. It's just figuring out how to double up and triple up. Um, yeah. Buy, buy in bulk and then piece it up. And that's and right. I, I, I know this from experience. I don't tell too many of my happy hustlers out there, but before I was happy hustling, I was also hustling. And, uh, you know, we were even hustling fake IDs. I, I would make and manufacture fake IDs. Man. Yeah, boy. We, and then we, I don't even want to say this one, but it, 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 it got to the point where we were making, you know, fake bills and, yeah. uh, and we were making, you know, counterfeits, like legit ones making, and, and, and you learn a ton on the street, like the common sense and the, and, and being street smart and then having to really, I mean, like you said, reinvest, reinvest in better products. And I think it's, it's, if you want to go there, it's a valuable lesson in business, like invest yeah, in I mean, yourself, you know, Bro, you look at the, you look at the, the Nipsey hustles, mm -hmm. right. And, and there's, there's so many dudes in the rap game, Jay-Z that, yep. that took this model and, and we're just like, okay, cool. How could we take this business model of double up and, and put, and put it into music? Yeah. You know, you look at a guy like Jay-Z and he's never fucking stopped. It was like, oh, cool. I'm going to run a clothing line. Okay, cool. I'm going to buy the fucking nets. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's just like, God damn, son. He just doesn't quit. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, like you're saying, man, I think it's valuable. I feel, I feel grateful for that knowledge that I have because without that, I don't think people have the long game. I see so many musicians get trapped in the, the hardest part of the industry to get out of is the, okay, well, there's these four local bars Mm. you know, that'll give us 800 bucks every Saturday, every Friday. And that's like this little comfort zone of like, all right, mm -hmm. yeah, well, I can pay my rent if I just do these bar gigs. It's like, yeah, dude, but then you're the local fucking bar band. Yeah. Ooh. You know, and, and, it, and, it, and it takes away that interest and trying to tell people, because people always be like, man, when we first started in Billings, like when are you playing again, it's like, okay, well, in three months and you got to buy a fucking ticket. Yeah. Ooh. When you're playing again in six months and the ticket's going to be five more bucks, mm. you know, I've always had that long game in mind. That's always yeah. been my goal. You know? Wow. Yeah. I think it's a valuable lesson and, and it really is like scarcity and urgency, you know, yep. <laughs> and, and you have to have both those elements. I mean, I love sales and I, I, without ethical scarcity and urgency, you're, you're just another commodity. So I think it's a valuable, a valuable takeaway there too. And I want to ask, where, where'd you get the name Sat Song? Talk to us about that. Um, so I met a, I was in Nepal and I had just got back from the Himalaya and I was in Kathmandu and there was this like outdoor climbing gym. Uh, and I went there and, and there was this kid with dreadlocks there. I was like, oh shit, he must be American. He was, and he's from Holland, but he spoke English. And I just ended up uh, hanging out with him and climbing and smoking weed. And, um, you know, he was the first first dude my age that I had bumped into over there. So we just kind of spent the day together. Yeah, smoking hash, drinking chai. <laughs> and when we were getting ready to part ways, he's like, hey, man, tomorrow morning we have Satsung at this spot if you want to come through. And I was like, what's that? And he was like, well, it's like a meeting. You know, we we'll read from the Gita or from uh, the Dhammapada or like, we'll read some spiritual text and then we just talk about it for an hour, you know? And I was like, man, that's a fucking cool word. Mm -hmm. And then when you look it up, it just says in the company of truth. Uh, when I got back to my hotel, I Googled it in the lobby and yeah. that was what came up. It was like, well, it translates to in the company of truth. And I was just like, that's a band name. Yeah. You know? So yeah. yeah. Shout I mean, out it's a to great name from Holland. <laughs> yeah, for I don't, real. I don't remember his name. <laughs> right. Well, Drew, I want to I want to pivot here and I want to talk about your martial arts, you know, training and and I know you're big into jujitsu and Muay Thai and MMA. Talk to us first and foremost. What, what do you think is the greatest lesson you've learned from from martial arts? 
fuck. Um, well, it's really humbling, mm. you know, by nature. But again, man, that patience. Um, you know, I just had this moment last week. I, I just started teaching and um, jujitsu or yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, I teach a couple times a week now. And, you know, I remember starting out and rolling with purple belts and just being like, fuck, dude, you know, like, just, <laughs> yeah. and not even them whooping my ass, them clearly staying at like a one or a two and yeah. just toying with me. Oh, yeah. You know, and just being like, holy shit, man, like, I'm never going to be this good. And last week, I was rolling with one of our white belts. Uh, this guy I really, really like. He's been with us like four months now, but he's lost like 20 pounds. He's just a sweetie. But yeah, um, nice. I was just rolling with him and just sweeping him at ease. And I'd go to mount and see what he'd do. And then I'd crawl on his back and then somersault off and just playing. Mm hmm. And I had this like, aha, of like, whoa, I'm the purple belt now. Yeah. Whoa. You know, like, <laughs> um, so it's a weird thing and you only get it from, from showing up. Mm. That's it. That's the only way you're going to get better at, at fighting is by training. Mm -hmm. There's no shortcut. There's no, uh, there's no hack. <laughs> yep. It's, it's time on the mat and time with your gloves on. That's it. Mm. Um, and I think that relates to everything. Yeah, you know, everybody's looking for these life hacks. And, and, and to me, man, that's what I love so much about fighting. There's no hack. There's no, you know, maybe one out of a 1000 fights, the referee fucks something up. But really, it's really honest. It's yeah. really honest about where you're at. And, and the self awareness in it isn't. I mean, it's just there. You know, you know how good you are right away there's no opinion there's no objectivity you're at where you were fucking at and it is provable tangible in front of your face every time you're on the mat um and i love mm -hmm. that about it it's honest there's no bullshit you know yeah. there's it's not yeah there's no there's no fouls there's you know it's just fucking, <laughs> yeah it's just pure um yeah so probably that man that just that commitment of just there is no shortcut it's it's commitment mm. Yeah, man, that I mean, that's a that's a beautiful lesson. And I, I totally agree with you, the raw, honest truth and, and the self awareness that you get from just competing, you know, mano y mano, like all in with someone else, you know, and finding out your strengths, your weaknesses and getting to the bottom of it. I mean, yeah, uh, and it's real <laughs> humbling too. you know, um, two weeks ago, I broke my nose. And um it was funny, man. I had done probably 10 rounds of sparring that day. And like I said, we got a bunch of cats getting ready for fights. So the room was thick. Mm. Um, and how sparring typically goes at the grindhouse is it starts off pretty mellow. <laughs> yeah. And then by about Someone gets four hit. or five. Yeah, yeah man. It just Harder it amps than up. The other. Yep. And yeah, and before you know it, we're just fighting. Um, <laughs> but my, my good boy, Whaley... I was feeling myself, man. I had my hands low. I was fighting oh, like yeah. Wonder Boy. Oh, nice. I was, I was landing spinning heel kicks. Like I oh, was just damn. feeling myself. And um, I threw a Superman punch and fucking smoked Whaley. Whaley's like two, <laughs> he's like 220 pounds. Oh, damn. And right after I did that, I watched his face change. And I was like, this mm. is a fucking seven and one pro fighter. And he is about to show me what the fuck is. Up. Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> I poked the <a> bear. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and he did, man. He went, oh, okay, cool. You want to be, th you know, like, like Nick Dia overthrowing oh, spinning shit now, huh? Yeah. And um, it was cool too. You know, for me, there's also this thing of like, <laughs> so to the average poor person, it's like, oh my God, you broke your nose. And to yeah. me, that shit just ain't a thing, man. I just am like, yeah. Like I told my wife when I got home, was like, yeah, man, I woke up this morning and voluntarily went to spar. A broken nose was part of, you know, that was a probable outcome. Yeah. Um, and I just love this shit, man. I just, I can't get away <laughs> from it. I just love every part of it. Um, so, yeah, it's, <laughs> You know, I think the thing that's special too is I think there's a lot of musicians that dabble, mm. but this shit isn't a dabble to me, man. Like MMA, it's my as actually it's my lifestyle. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's what I do. It's like when I'm home, that's who I am. I I'm training. I'm at mm. like you ask anybody at the grindhouse, and like I'm there. Like that's mm. my shit. It's what I yeah. do. It's it's my life. So 
um, it's a special thing to go out in the world with. I feel like I have this edge. Yeah, this <laughs> edge. Cause I, there's, I don't know anybody else in my industry who has this lifestyle, you know? Mm. Yeah. You'll, you'll meet a dude that's like, Oh yeah, I did jujitsu for a few weeks, but you know, there's nobody that's in it. So yeah, yeah it's, man. it's a really special thing. And it's created, I have these little pockets of family all over the country mm -hmm. of gyms that I train at. You know, I have a place I train when I'm in Chicago. I have a place I train when I'm in Texas. I have mm. multiple spots in California, North Carolina. So I have these little gym families. Yeah. Um, it's cool, man. It's a special thing. And, and, and like we we're saying about people following their dreams, it's like, you know, I, I watch all the UFC undercards now and I see people that I train with. I'm like, yo, that's my oh, fucking really? guy. Yeah, man. Oh, dude. So it's, it's so special, man, to see the parallels between an up and coming fighter and a musician. You know, it's just like, fuck, man, I just need my shot. Yeah. But until then, I'm in here working my ass off, you know, mm. preparing for my, like you said, preparing for my shot. So when it, when they say, hey, here's your window, I can go, all right, yeah. <laughs> you know, let me show you what I can do. Yeah, man. Uh, there's a lot of parallels. You're right. I, I haven't actually thought about that correlation, but both are, you know, you have to be intrinsically motivated for yep. both fighting and, and music. Like there's no team, you know, there's no like, Oh, if I, if, if I fuck up it on a, like a soccer field, like for instance, I played soccer my whole life. Like if I fuck up, yeah, that's, you know, maybe someone notices my coach, but not the, the, not anyone else really, maybe my teammates, but when you fight and you mess up, you're on the floor. Oh yeah. Ow, yeah. You know? no, immediate. <laughs> yeah. I always, I always joke, you know, I think I've always been drawn, you know, there's this kind of public perception that I'm like this meditating zen out dude and it's not you know that it's in the gym yeah. is where i find that zen and i've always been attracted to these like rock climbing ice climbing skiing it's like consciousness at gunpoint mm. it's like no dude if you're not present there's severe physical consequences mm. that that's when i can be present there's got to be something on the line you can't just yeah. be like okay sit in that chair and if you if you aren't present then nothing happens you know yeah. <laughs> there, yeah. there has to be there has to be an underlying threat dude that have you that is such a great line consciousness at gunpoint that i mean have you yeah i think i've no that's my shit i think dude i, I say is, it all the time do you god that should be a song man i don't know yeah that's dope yeah consciousness at gunpoint wow i mean and and i want to talk about it like i mean i love that we talked to mma and i and i totally like respect the heck out of you for for diving all in and being you know a warrior both in the in the you know music game and in the the fight game and i think it's there's so much correlation and and to build that mental toughness and fortitude and resilience to to make it in any field all the happy hustlers got to know you got to put in the reps you got to put in the time you got to commit but especially you doing it and you know going now for your black belt it's a it's an impressive feat not very many people get that man yeah so not shout out to you for getting that and, and getting after it i know not yet but soon you yeah know, that's, you're that's on your the, way <laughs> yeah. I, I want it um i want it more than anything man and i just don't see yeah i don't see my life w without that being being yeah. a thing you yeah. know it's no, something yeah. that must happen you know for sure well and i think that is such a it's such a, a beautiful realization. Like when you truly want something bad enough, you're willing to do whatever it takes to get it, you know? And that's like, I think what everyone out there listening and watching right now, you have to recognize what that thing is for you. You know, for Drew, it's, it's this black belt that, that it, it, it symbolizes this achievement that he's been striving for and this discipline and this focus, but you have to figure out what that is for you. Is it your first book? Is it, is it, you know, an online course? Is it, you know, just, helping you know elderly at the the nursing home you volunteer at like what is that thing is it you know playing a pro sport i mean we all have those things that are worth fighting for that are worth going all in for and i think it's so so awesome that you found that both with music and both with mma um, yeah, man. it is man so i'm um, drew i like to ask all my guests like a, a, an array of questions in multiple disciplines. And I want to talk spirituality first with you. I, I call them these happy hustle hacks, right? Like what is a happy hustle hack for you personally for spirituality that you use to tap in, to get present, um, you know, to really connect with the higher power that you could potentially share with the happy hustlers out there? You know, for me, for me, it's getting outside um, mm. because I think there is this, 
uh, there's kind of this web that we get caught in as modern humans. Um, you know, the way social media is set up, we're in this constant, um, there's this constant thread of other people's lives happening that are all bullshit. It's just a highlight reel. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, no one's showing you their real shit. Yeah, um, you're so true. And so there's that. And then there's also the like, Sociopolitical landscape that just from the outside looking in is just fucking chaos because that's what sells. So the plan, mm -hmm. the plan for the news is to make you worried, Fearful. concerned, <laughs> afraid, scared, yeah. um, to, to think the world is on fire. Um, so I think it's really important for me. I know it's really important to go into the mountains and just be like, whoa, like, this is all bullshit and this is happening in a million miles an hour all of the time, but this mountain is just here. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been sharing this with everyone years ago. I'd gotten dropped by my agent. My drummer quit in the same week. And um, I, I called Trevor Hall crying <sighs> and he said, man, in times like this, it's important to remember that a mountain is still a mountain and a river is still a river. Wow. And it didn't hit me when he said it. I was like, fuck you, man. I need a place. <laughs> yeah. um, That's super woke. <laughs> yeah, but I but I come back to it all the time is that it's like, it's so easy to forget that rivers are flowing, animals are hunting and feeding. There's this natural cycle of the earth that is always moving. Yep. It is completely unaffected by Instagram. That is completely unaffected by the news cycle. Yeah. That is real. That is natural. That is a never ending. Mm. So for me, I try to tap into that, you know, and I tap into it a lot of different ways in the summer. It's fishing and being on the river in the fall. It's hunting Yep. in the winter. It's skiing, or I just got into cross country skiing, which I never thought I would oh, do, yeah. but oh man, Good it's workout. just so, yeah. And it's so fun to just be like, yeah out on a trail in the middle of winter it's so quiet and so mm. peaceful um yep so to me i think that's the biggest life hack you know it's one thing that i feel really bad for like even my bandmates you know one's in minneapolis one's in charlotte one's in brooklyn mm. and i'm just like man i had them come out here to make the record and they were just like holy fuck and i'm like <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah dude this is the real world <laughs> you know yeah. like this is we it we got to keep that on the download, Drew. You know, Montana's I know, got man. a lot of bears, a lot of bears, and it's yep. freezing. I was, it's so <laughs> funny, man. Whenever I uh, I have this kind of like ongoing social media joke of whenever people are like, Montana looks so amazing. I'm always like, yeah, Idaho's way cooler, though. Yeah, North Dakota's a shit, honestly. North Dakota's dope. <laughs> Wyoming is, has way more room. Oh, you yeah, know, so much Property's room. cheaper. Yeah, that's what I say, too, man. My, my fiance and I always are like, man, there, there are so many bears here. They're everywhere. Like, they're just eating people left yeah, and they're right. Pig, they're like pigeons, man. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's so true. Well, that's a great lesson, man. And I totally agree with you. Like, tapping into nature is my solace. Just being present still, fly fishing, you know, going outside, snowboarding, like you said, hunting, being out, just tapped in, hiking, camping. I mean that's where I really find myself in, in inner peace. So great lesson there. Let's talk about entrepreneurship. And I, I know you're, you're an entrepreneur, bro. Like do you, really Absolutely. you're a hardcore yeah. entrepreneur and a happy hustler. No question. Talk to us about a happy hustle hack for entrepreneurship that you could share out there. You know, I would say again, the self-awareness thing is huge. Um, is what you have, what everyone's going to want. Um, and I think that, is really easy to do. Like, it's mm. just really easy to quantify. Like you can see, is something growing or is it not growing? And if it's not growing, have you tried everything to make it grow? Yep. Um, but a big thing for me, man, is that self-investment is always asking, what could I be doing with my money to make it bigger mm. rather than, you know, do I want to lease a fucking G wagon? So everybody thinks I have money. <laughs> yeah. So you know what I mean? <laughs> Where it's yep. like, um, you know, I see that all the time, um, where people get caught up in the appeal of looking like they have money. Mm. Um, and I don't really give a fuck about all that, man. I just, um, I just want to know that my family is going to be secure if I'm not here. Mm. So, uh, you know, for me, a big part of, of the entrepreneurship and, and being smart with money is, you know, always going, if something happens to me, will my family be okay? Yeah. 
and, and the answer right now is if people keep listening to my music, yes, you know, they yeah. should be set for quite a while. So, yeah, you know, um, that, you know, if you can zoom out and don't think so fucking small time, you know, like I love Gary V all the time when, you know, his, <laughs> his ongoing joke. And when people are like, man, you had this much money by your thirties. He's like, yeah, man. Cause while y'all were fucking partying and getting bottle service in your twenties, I was fucking reinvesting, you know? Yeah, and like, I yeah. think that's so important is it's like, do you want to fuck around? Or are you trying to do the thing? Mm. And that's it. And yeah. that's it. You know? And I think all the time too, I think there's a thing that happens and it doesn't matter what you're doing when you're an entrepreneur is there's this really shitty phase where, <laughs> yeah. where you know what you're doing and nobody else does. And there isn't any money and there's nothing to show. And I went through a phase when I first started getting money where I was like, I'm going to buy all the Jordans I wanted when I was a kid. You know, I'm going to buy fucking hundred dollar t-shirts you know, and just being a fucking knucklehead significance and, and status searching for yeah, that. Cause yeah. well, and it's because I wanted this outside validation of just like, yep. Oh shit. Well, those are fucking really rare shoes. So he must yeah. be doing good. And it's like, you know, now they all sit in boxes on top. I live in Montana. When the fuck am I going <laughs> to, yeah, it's, it's you so know true. what I mean? So it's like, um, <laughs> getting through that phase of, of being okay with the fact that nobody knows what you're up to. Mm. You know, that was a big one for me that I didn't do well in that phase. I wanted everyone to know I was doing good and that I was building shit and tell everyone what I was doing. And, you know, because there's, especially in music, it's like, well, you ain't been on TV yet. You know, so yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. Like, you know, it's a hard thing to quantify, especially in a place like Red Lodge, because everyone knows me as the dude that worked at Sylvan Peak and was a soccer coach. You yeah, know, right? it's not, I wasn't like, you know, so it's like no one knows me as is this dude it's like if i want a grammy people be like hey i heard you got some trophy or something you know? <laughs> yes, it's like, no, no, no one would give a fuck so um yeah just be a, being okay during that building phase and knowing that you don't need to tell everyone what the fuck you're doing man and if you know what you're doing then keep your head down and do it man the mm. world will know when they're supposed to know and if they don't ever know that's even cooler then you can just mm. be this dude that's like low-key killing it and no one will treat you different yeah. Oh, so well said. Stay the course, you know, just commit to the process, put in the yep. time. I mean, it, it's, it sounds all like cliche jargon, but it's, it's the damn truth. You gotta, there's a reason why everyone says yeah. the same shit, man. It's cause it's yeah. real, you know? <laughs> yeah. So true, man. So true. I love that. I love that happy hustle hack. Let's talk health too. Cause I know you're big into health and performance. Yes. You know, I know you're going to get some stem cells and like you're big into just optimizing your, your, your yourself in all fields talk to us about a happy hustle hack for your health that that you think would be valuable to the happy hustlers out there uh get into a routine man you know what i found whether it's my creativity my drive or any of that if, if my health isn't on point mm. um then it does then this shit just doesn't run right yep um, and for me, you know, I have a pretty severe neck injury. So it's like, I, it was chest, it was chest and shoulder day for me. So I always know that after chest and shoulder day, I'm going to be in a significant amount of pain for the rest of the day. But I, I can, I can bypass that by knowing like, you know, I wake up at five 30 and I'm at the gym by 6 AM mm. and then I'm home by seven 30 at the latest. So when the rest of my family is getting up, and just starting their day, I already done something. You yeah. know, there, there's something about being in the gym when it's still dark outside that gives you this edge. You know, it gets to fucking, you know, I look at the clock right now and I'm like, damn, dude, I've been up and at him for five hours. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and, um, and, and the food that you're putting in your body and the supplements, and I, it's just all so important that you're running at an optimum level because I feel like there's, um, I see people that are caught in these cycles and a lot of it is this kind of like lethargy and it's like, dude, you can break that so quick. Like it takes one month, one mm -hmm. month of exercising five times a week and eating right and all that shit before you just go, Holy shit, dude, I am a different fucking animal. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Your sex drive goes up like everything, you know, and, and too, in this day and age, man, there's no fucking excuses. Like, yeah. It's just the the fitness industry right now, the regenerative medicine industry right now is that mm -hmm. it's like, 
you know, get your, if, if you feel lethargic and shitty all the time, get your fucking labs done. Go to a regenerative yeah. wellness place. Get your fucking labs done and see what your blood says. Yep. Test. You don't know? guess. I always yeah, dude. That. Yeah. Hey, Cause that's the thing. It's like, oh man, well, f- no wonder you feel lethargic. Your test is at 200. Yeah. Let's, let's fix that. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, oh yeah. You're not absorbing magnesium. No wonder you're sleeping like shit. So yep. it's just like, man, you can, these hacks are available. Save up $120, go get your labs done. Talk yep. to someone that knows what the fuck they're talking about. And, um, but I just, yeah, man, the, the health thing is, is paramount to me, whether we're on the road or I'm home, I have yep. to have that exercise. And for me, it is a flipping of the script. When I'm working out, I don't look at it as output. Mm. I look at it as input. I'm not exerting energy, lifting weights. Mm. I'm lifting these weights to put energy into my body. Yep. So I have like, when I'm in the gym, that's my mind frame is like, nah, dude, I'm in here getting powered the fuck up. Yeah. So you know what I mean? So I'm going into my day like, yeah, dude, I'm fucking pumped and jacked and ready to roll. What's up? Mm-hmm. You know? Um, and, and, it, and it just bit like, you've seen it, you know, you were in the wellness industry, you see yeah. what happens with, um, you know, I'm going to put my bass player, Carl on the spot. <laughs> when, when he first started touring with us, he was, you know, drinking damn near a two liter of soda a day, mm. ate pizza or burgers every day. Mm was just overweight. His energy was always low. He slept all day in the fucking van. Mm. And then he just took a hard left and was like, Nope. Started running. Then from running, he started lifting. And then he was like, fuck dude, I can't really eat this shit and then want to go run. Yeah. So he starts cleaning up his diet a little bit. So it was this like two year gradual thing. You see Carl now, a, his body is completely different, mm. but B, he's the motherfucker in the morning that's in the front seat with me when we're driving. Yeah. Just like, yep, no. I'm up, son, what's up? You know, I'm co-pilot <laughs> today. And um, and it's been a really beautiful thing to watch. Uh, yeah. Because you see when when people start putting their health first, yep. it's like, oh my God, dude, your drive to want to build your business, to want to do all these things, it skyrockets because that energy's there. Yeah, so true, man. I I love that. Like just having a routine dialed in. I mean, I, my my friend Craig Ballantyne, he he says you got to control your mornings, conquer the chaos of the afternoons, and concentrate on what really matters in the evenings, right? And if you structure your day so you're crushing the most important things early on, like you working out, getting creative, going through your process, you know, meditating, tapping in, and then by the time the afternoon hits, you already won the day. It's all bonus, yep. you know? <laughs> and, yep. and like, and I think health and performance, like for me, I know I got to get hot and I got to get cold every day. Like I go on an ice bath here. We, I go to the Bozeman Hot Springs, you know, they yep. got a cold tub around 40 degrees and a hot tub, you know, 110. And I have my own sauna here too. So I'm like, I know cold and hot thermogenesis is a, is a priority in my life to decrease the inflammation, to burn calories, to increase blood flow circulation, the list goes on and on. But when you build your routine and you start stacking in, you know, whole natural organic foods and, and, you know, the proper supplements, which you maybe are deficient in, because that's really what disease stems from. It's a environmental genetic mismatch. It's, you know, vitamin and mineral deficiencies and it's toxins. Those are like, when you break it down, it comes to those three elements. So you have to understand test. Don't guess. I think that was great advice, Drew. Like, I mean, you got to get regular labs. If you're, if you're serious about, you know, optimizing, especially your cognitive performance, like entrepreneurs are happy hustlers out there. If you want to stay sharp and really become the best version of yourself, you got to optimize your mind, not just take, you know, an alpha brain here and there, like, you know, a yeah. nootropic, like that's great. Sure. You know, but you got to, it's more than that. It's everything around you. It's your environment. And a lot of people, they don't talk about it, but how much this, you know, tech and EMFs have a negative effect on us, you mm-hmm. know, and just being surrounded by toxic blue light. I mean, I could see it with our, you know, back when I was deep in the biohacking game, how much these, these EMFs played a negative role in performance. And so when you start to, you know, turn off your Wi-Fi at night, not that big a deal, unplug the damn thing. It turns right back on, you know, when you yeah. plug it in, you know, and then put your phone on airplane mode when you're not using it. And like, you know, when you're not, uh, you know, when it's like three hours before bed, throw on some blue blockers. Like your, your body will thank you. You will sleep better. You will, you know, perform better the next morning. So these little things, I went on a tangent here, but it's- No, that's huge, you know, man. You know, yeah. another huge part of wellness that we touched on at the beginning, man, is who are you hanging out with? Yeah. You know, that was a huge part of my 
my story is what happens when you start getting your shit together, mm -hmm. especially when you come from a background of, of selling <clears throat> drugs and partying and fucking off. Yeah. Is I, there's like the, it's like the phases of grief. Yep. Is people go, um, at first people are excited, like, Oh yeah, that's my boy. He's doing his <laughs> yeah. thing. And then like, Oh, you too cool to hang out with me. Nah, dude, not too cool. Too fucking busy. You know, like, yeah. I, I don't got time to fuck around. Like, no, dude, I'm not going to go on a two day fucking blow bender with you. I got shit to do. And I got, a family. <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, and then this, um, ultimately it's respect, you know, and, and, yeah. I, and I've had to have the conversation with three, four of my oldest friends in the world who are just like, look, bro, our puzzle pieces don't match anymore. Our value mm. systems are different. Yeah. Our, uh, the hierarchies that we are trying to climb are different. Yeah. So it's like, it's no disrespect. It doesn't mean I don't love you. It doesn't mean I care about you, but I'm trying to go this way and you're trying to grab my ass and bring me back down here. And I just, I can't fuck with it, man. I got shit to do. I'm trying to yeah. go that way, not that way. And if you want to <laughs> hang out down here, cool, but I'm not, I'm not hanging. You know? yeah, I'm yeah. out. No. Um, and that's, a, and that's, a, that's a huge thing. I, th I especially think for young people. Yeah. So true. Yeah, man. I mean, you said it, you, you got to really take stock in who's in your inner circle and if they're raising your vibration or not and get rid of them if they're not. I mean, and you could be respectful and you don't have to burn the bridge, but you just got to keep it real. So great lesson there. Drew, I want to, I want to get to the rapid fire round and then we'll wrap this Love bad it. boy up. This is basically where I just ask you random questions. You answer honestly, first thing that comes to mind. Are you ready? Ready. <laughs> Favorite movie? Go. The Notebook. Oh, no, you did not say that with that neck tap, bro. I Come know. on. <laughs> the notebook and the Dixie Chicks, man. I'm telling you. Dude, I love it. Favorite food? Uh, Traditional Japanese ramen. Extra Ooh. pork belly. Oh, good one. Favorite book? Ooh, Revolutionary Suicide by Huey Newton. Oh, nice. What's your spirit animal? The bison. Oh, right on. Best business advice? Um, double up. Don't keep the money. Reinvest it. Mm, love it. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Uh, uh, not feeling pain. Ooh. Being, one, being permeable to pain. That would yeah, be so dope. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one. One word you wish to be synonymous with your name for the rest of your life ethical oh if you had one billboard to share your message and this was the last piece of content that you ever put out what would that billboard say Ooh. work now chill later <laughs> i love that yeah. and three things you're most grateful for uh, my family um, my health and art you know mm music fighting painting all of it art love that man drew this has been awesome brother i just want to acknowledge you for sharing your love your light your wisdom with the happy hustlers out there man i so appreciate it where can people go to find out more about you to listen to i know you got a new album coming out where's the best place for people to check it all out uh just hit us on instagram man we always have the link tree in the bio that'll take you to everywhere else uh so yeah just at satsang uh s-a-t-s-a-n-g um yeah, there is where everything is happening. That's where all of our news always hits first. So, Awesome. So check them out on IG. We'll link to it in the show notes as well. Dude, this has been awesome, man. I so appreciate you. Any final words before I ask the final question? Uh, no, man. I appreciate you uh, uh, you having me on, man. I look forward to hanging out with you and, um, on not a Zoom call. Yeah, I'm for real, with bro. You in real life, man. We'll We're get gonna... together. We'll get in some cold water. Yeah, well, we should. And do some outdoor things. I'm with so, it. Yeah, brother. So final question, Drew, what does happy hustling mean to you? Um, taking work ethic and, and putting all of that into something that you're passionate about, not something that, uh, that has a guaranteed means to the end, you know, whether that's music or whether you're really passionate about tech, it's, a, it's about, you know, the, the old thing is if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. I think that's bullshit. Um, <laughs> I, th I think if you love what you do, you'll work harder than anybody else every day of your life. Um, mm. 
because it doesn't feel like fruitless work. You know, you're not working for somebody else. You're working towards something that you really care about. Yep. So to me, to me, that's it. In a nutshell, man, is, is, is putting all of your drive and work and, and sweat equity into something that means something to you rather than, you know, something with an end goal in mind. That's just currency, you know, mm. dude, love that mic drop. Appreciate you, Drew. This has been awesome. Yeah, Thanks, bro. everybody. Peace and love. Take care, bro. Oh, so.